I want to welcome everybody. My name is Lauren Brown, Clinical Director of AccuBalance Wellness Center in Vancouver and the Chair of the Integrated Fertility Symposium. And today we have Dr. Paul Turek, a reproductive urologist, has his practice in both Beverly Hills and San Francisco. And I think what I love most about Dr. Paul is the information he's constantly putting out. So I want you to have access to that as well. So today he's gonna give you a lecture on the back to the basics, why treat male fertility before using assisted reproduction. And I've got to call um, your attention to his blog, which is full of great tips and advice. TurekOnMensHealth.com. Please check out that um, blog, TurekOnMensHealth.com. And now let's hear from our reproductive urologist, Dr. Paul Turek. Thank you, Lauren. Welcome. So I was asked to talk about, is it worth treating men when you can do things like IVF or test tube baby technology to conceive? Because it's all over the place. There's 500 IVF centers in America. Is it worth treating men? Is it worth going back to the basics? We've been doing it for 50 years. Uh, do we have any value or should everyone just go to IVF? Great questions. So remember IVF, you may not know this, but it was uh, IVF and ICSI. So the IVF is where sperm and eggs meet in a dish. ICSI is where someone in the lab chooses a sperm and injects it into the egg because that allows for fewer sperm to do the same job. Uh, but it's also not quite natural because an embryologist drinking coffee is choosing your sperm, not God or Darwin. So that was developed by accident in 1992 at that microscope in Belgium. And it was not experimented with or studied first, it was the same year as the Endeavour um, space shuttle. But it did allow fatherhood with men with fewer sperm, fewer modal sperm and sperm that's not in the ejaculate. So it allowed it did open up fertility for men that was, were previously unable to have kids. But it does bypass genetic infertility because, you know, again, God or Darwin isn't choosing that sperm necessarily. It does alter natural selection. This is not what we've been doing for 5 million years. Lucy didn't do this. The leaky discoveries didn't do this. Sons of men with no ejaculated sperm have no ejaculated sperm. So, you know, the, the sins of the father, not sins, but the conditions of the father pass the, to the son. And the sons of men with low sperm counts have low sperm counts. So, there, so, you know, I like this technology. It has helped a lot of my cancer survivors and other patients have kids where they've never been able to. But it did occur, arrived on stage without scientific validation or any cost analysis or any study of its effectiveness. And it really doesn't cure infertility. It does bypass it. It's sort of like saying, you know, you don't, you don't cure the cancer, you keep it in check. But it's not cancer, clearly. But um, the, the idea is, it, it, you know, the problem goes away because you have a kid, but you still have the problem. And I'm going to talk a little bit about men because they can have other problems that are reflected in infertility. So that's not necessarily a good idea to avoid evaluating men. Um, I'm all about the man. So I'm going to go through some evidence that what we offer works for men that may keep you away from assisted reproduction or IVF. So for instance, stress is one of them. Um, this is a study of heavy exercise of athletes he exercising heavily on the left part of this graph for 60 weeks and their sperm counts went down 60% if they exercised more than 10 hours a week, two hours a day, five days a week at heavy intensity. Then they stopped and then they went through a period of light exercise, which is sort of, this is intense exercise, this is moderate exercise. And guess what? Their sperm counts came back up. Their testosterone did too, full recovery. So what does this tell us? If you stress the body out financially, emotionally, travel or physical, Olympic athletes, you're gonna, you know, fertility is not preserved. It's not what you think about. Your body's not thinking about, hey, let's have a kid while I'm running from a woolly mammoth, right? So that's a problem. And stress is a simple thing. If you can help, you know, acupuncture, yoga, massage, et cetera, those things can reduce stress in men. Makes a lot of sense. Doesn't need a lot of data. Has more data than Ixie did. Obesity, being overweight. So there's no question. We know that men who are overweight have more trouble conceiving. One of the best studies was Danish, 26,000 men, and BMI of 25 is normal, mildly overweight 
in this range, maybe moderately overweight, but the chance of conception goes down by 20% and almost 40% as the weight goes up. So just being, just, just weight alone can do it. And so again, that's pretty good medical value. Medications also low hanging fruit here. There's certain medications, including hair medication, Propecia or finasteride, calcium channel blockers used for blood pressure control, and steroids, either anabolic or just testosterone. These are no-nos. These will actually drop your sperm count often to zero. Actually, the anabolics will. Calcium channel blockers, sperm look fine. They don't fertilize. They just bounce off the egg. So these are kind of no-brainer, low-hanging fruit to change in men. Even diet or supplements, uh, although... A lot of data has been done from uh, meta-analyses, which are kind of the next best thing to a randomized trial to show that maybe there's not helpful that men eat well or eat well, eat a diet or take supplements. The, the concept of men being on prenatals is kind of empowered by this data because it shows in three studies that if men take a prenatal supplement or antioxidant supplement, the pregnancy rate at IVF is higher and the miscarriage rates lower. And this means it's two to four fold higher or one, you know, 1.7 fold higher to four fold higher. But as the data matures, it's not quite as uh, impressive, but it's still impressive. So it looks like when men take antioxidants as prenatals, that their partners are more likely to conceive with IVF, which is a good, good thing to use because it's, it's measurable, objective, and they're less likely to miscarry. That's similar to the data that women have been using for prenatal supplements for 40 years, right? So it's um, kind of there. We did a study looking at just lifestyle. So I had men who I thought were um, pretty were unexplained infertility. Their history was pretty pretty normal. No, no, nothing bad going on. They had some physical exam findings, but nothing, nothing worrisome really. And uh, they weren't conceiving, their partners were normal. And we watched them and I said, you know, you're fine, try harder. And they went online and said, Turk couldn't figure out what was wrong with us. And I said, no, 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 that's not what I said. I said that you should try harder and make some changes and you'll probably conceive okay because there's nothing wrong with you. And so I actually called these patients up. I had a student from USC call them all up. This is getting published in January or February, 2021. And ask them what happened last year after you saw Turek. 65% had conceived naturally, another 15 to 20% conceived with assisted reproduction. After just that, lifestyle recommendations, no treatments, no surgeries, no medications, just maybe you should take an antioxidant. Maybe you should be home when your wife's you know, ovulating. Maybe you should try um, this, let, you know, time dinner course this way instead of this way, that kind of stuff all panned out and 65%, that's as good as it gets. I mean, we can't really beat that with anything that we can mm -hmm. offer medically. Well, I think that's worth repeating, Dr. Turk. So um, these are men and um, all that the intervention here is antioxidant therapy and then lifestyle. So helping them with their diet, Stress, their sleep, exercise, rest. Probably weight loss. Okay. Probably less exercise, all that stuff. And, all things in moderation. Yep. And these men were cleared. So some of them may have a varicocele, but cleared as in their semen analysis is normal. normal? Okay. Right. So, there's, so their doctor saying your semen analysis is normal. Let's do ICSI. But you're suggesting that um, actually, if your semen analysis is normal, and assuming the partner, the wife, the female is normal, um, you saw an increase in pregnancy rates if they change lifestyle, antioxidants, um, whether it's natural or even in the IVF setting. Right, so some of them did acupuncture, some of them did um, yoga, some of, you know, all the things, all the lifestyle things. So I, you know, it's not that I was right in improving it. I just think that lifestyle matters a lot. And so- And I'm sure there were dietary changes. I'm sure there was weight loss. I told people, you need to take great care of yourself because sperm production wants to run hard and what you're doing is holding it down. So I think everything they thought about, they changed a little bit, but I couldn't quantify all that. You know, you're starting to sound like a Chinese medicine or naturopathic physician doctor here, or what I call Dr. 3.0, a Western doctor <laughs> that is integrating um, the diet, lifestyle, supplements, acupuncture. Continue on this, very, very interesting. 
Yeah, I mean, it, it took a bit to get that polished because, again, here's another one we did where we just pulled men out of hot baths and hot tubs and saw their sperm counts go up by 400%. And, um, you know, but, I mean, just made a lot of sense. Ridiculously hard to publish because everyone thought, well, we know this doctor, so why, why do we have to publish this? Of course, it became my most cited paper and picked up by the New York Times when it got published. But um, this is kind of, again, low-hanging fruit that is got data to it, which makes a lot of sense. And um, in, a, in an era when everyone's going back to basics, I think it's really important to think about this. There's also economic arguments for male. So uh, one of them is just, is it cheaper to have a kid with things than it is to go to IVF? So we, the Schlegel group in New York has published vasectomy reversal cost per pregnancy or delivery versus IVF. And it was a third cheaper, a third the price of IVF to have a baby with a vasectomy reversal, right? So others published uh, varicocele, including us, and using varicocele, another treatment we offer is varicocele repair. Is that cheaper for couples to have a newborn? And the answer was in New York, yes. And in San Francisco in our group, yes, about half the price. To fix a varicocele as opposed to going to IVF, because IVF is sort of always out there. It's kind of like the elephant in the room. And um, what about decision modeling? So more sophisticated version of cost effectiveness is to look at analytically on a computer, lots of different variables and compare one to the other and see if the age of the partner or the sperm count, what, what matters most compared to everything else. So you can look at lots of variables and, and run them against each other and see which matter the most. And when we looked at vasectomy reversal, in this modeling uh, versus IVF, and this is how the pattern went. They, if you go north, they have a reversal and they're pregnant or not, and then they may switch over to IVF. If you go south, they do IVF and they may do a second cycle. And so you actually attach numbers to each of those nodes and you can run it on a computer with all these different variables and 50,000 patients and figure stuff out. And this taught us that this is kind of complex, but the ability the cost per pregnancy on the left axis varies by the, your ability to get a good outcome after vasectomy reversal and get the sperm count back. And if you're not doing a good job below 78%, then IVF in red is going to be cheaper for the couple. If you are doing a good job at reversals, you're always going to be cheaper than IVF for the couple. So the 78 to 100%, the, the black bar is below the red one, which means it's cheaper. So this is nice because it tells us, you know, it tells the surgeon if you're if you're not got a rate of 78% return of sperm, then you know you probably shouldn't be doing them because the couples are better off doing IVF somewhere else, right? Or going some to some other surgeon. So it's nice because it measures the surgeon, which is a really it, it's hard to get that polished. No one likes to be measured, but I I really like it. The and then if you go if you go maternal age and you add Markov modeling to it, so you do. And if you can follow these these decisions with age, you can find that the ability of IVF, which is blue, to work versus the vasectomy reversal. So the higher the bar, the higher the line on the gra graph here, the more benefit to the patient in terms of cost effectiveness. So if you're only willing to spend $65,000 per pregnancy, which is a lot, then, then vasectomy reversal will always beat out IVF for any maternal age except for a little area where they cross in the 30s. But if you're willing to spend $150,000 to have a kid, then IVF becomes more competitive, right? Because it's, it's, it, you're doing more of them and it works over time. So it, it does get a little better here, but that's if you're willing to spend that much money. So what do you think it is if you're willing to spend $15,000 or 20 or one IVF cycle? So the reversal is gonna win, maybe because it gives you a monthly opportunity that you don't get with IVF, right? You do a reversal, you're there's sperm in the ejaculate, you fail one month, you try the next month. You fail IVF one month, you're out for a, a bunch of money and you gotta throw another bunch of money in. So I think below 65,000, there's not gonna be any point at which a IVF would be more cost effective than reversal at any female age. That's the kind of data you learn from this. So, there's a last kind of argument, which is, can the things we do for men affect the use of assisted reproduction? So 
you know, right now, if you have um, low sperm counts, there are options. You can go to IVF and ICSI with a single sperm injection. You can go to IVF where they just put the sperm and eggs together. You could go to inseminations in the office, depending on the sperm count. And those are options. Or you could fix this thing called a varicocele, which is a vein in the scrotum that heats up the testicle that we've been fixing for 50 years and see what happens. And there's pregnancy rates associated with this. And it's pretty simple. It's a lot cheaper than IVF. It is a surgical procedure. It takes about an hour. Men have about two days of downtime. And then their sperm counts go up in most men. So in this couple, in this series, men who needed IVF and ICSI because of their sperm counts walking into this, if you fix the varicocele, we had a 17% conception rate naturally. They were ICSI, they had really low sperm counts, less than a million. 20% became insemination candidates. That means 37% of couples who only could have used IVF ICSI before the varicocele repair were able to get out of it. And in, if they were IVF candidates, say one to 5 million sperm, 31% conceived after varicocele repair naturally, and 55% became candidates for IUI. That means 86% of men who would have gone to IVF after varicocele repair did not need it. Our so question can, on the varicocele repair, Dr. Turk, is clinically, how long um, should they expect um, the change after a repair if they're trying to conceive naturally? Is it the typical three months of sperm maturation? Or I've heard you before say it can be up to six months. Right. So in, in this paper, we published that curve and the average time to conceive in the couples, all couples, uh, was about six and a half to seven months, which is two cycles of sperm production. So, so that's the consideration, Lauren, which is you do need six months to make sure that you play out the value of the varicocele. And if you don't have six months, then I wouldn't do it, right? Because time matters. And if she's 42 and months matter, you may not want to wait. But for the 30-year-old couple, it's a shame to go to IVF. Right. Um, so or strategy is you do the repair and then the IVF, if you go into the IVF, it's before six months, hopefully it's successful. But if it's not, that repair now has had some time. So before your next cycle, maybe you conceive naturally or you have a better chance for that second IVF. Yeah. And, you know, you do see pregnancies at two to three months, which is the first cycle of sperm production. But the average 50 percent of the crowd is conceived by about six, seven months and about by nine to 12. If they haven't, they won't. Probably. And what, probably. I'm hear and yeah. what I'm hearing then, there's a lot of things that the men can do. There's diet, um, lifestyles, uh, antioxidant therapy, varicocele repairs. There's lots of things the men can do so they may not need to go into the IVF or at least increase their chances of IVF and conceiving naturally. Um, I hope, I don't know if we'll talk about it today, but we'll ask, like, how do we get the men into the clinic? Because uh, <laughs> we see women come into our clinic saying we have male factor, but the guy's not even in, the, in part of the treatment. That's the eternal problem because IVF programs, I like to advertise that they treat male infertility. So anyone who goes online, if you see my site, like the Turek Clinic, you're gonna see an ad above it from an IVF program. We treat male infertility and everyone thinks it's the same. So I just wanna say, you know, no published study in 20 or 30 years since IVF ICSI came out has ever shown that the technology is cheaper or you know, cost effective. Is it faster? Potentially. Is the overall pregnancy rate higher? Well, not better than lifestyle changes, at least in my, in, you know, among unexplained couples. But um, we beat it out every time, but it, it's sort of ignored. And that's the problem is because I think that a lot of care, fertility care is driven by women. Um, so what we offer men is healthy and it's cheaper and it allows for conception at home. What did Woody Allen say? He said, sex is the most fun I've ever had without laughing. People would rather conceive at home. There's nothing wrong with it. So just because technology's there and it's popular doesn't mean it's better. I think that's all I had to say. And I don't have the, the secret to get men in, but if they do get in, we'll take great care of them. So I guess uh, uh, the message, uh, I'll clarify the message um, to get across. And again, do check out um, Dr. Turek, the Turek Clinic, also his blog, TurekOnMensHealth.com. Um, if you're in the Vancouver area and you want to do integration, check out AccuBalance.ca because we like to take care of the men. A um, couple of questions for you, Dr. Turek, then. Sure. 
um, just kind of these take home message. So if somebody, if the couple has been diagnosed of unexplained, the man is cleared, the woman's of the right age, they can't find anything wrong with her. Often they're going right into an IVF. What is your um, approach to this then? Is there something that men can do? Do you think based on the research and some of the new testing that's coming out, other than the semen analysis, are men contributing to the infertility, even though it says unexplained? Are men contributing to recurrent pregnancy loss, even though they're saying it's unexplained? Are men contributing to the embryo development in an IVF setting? What can you share with the public on what the latest research and some of the new testing um, on epigenetics is sharing? Yeah, so we used to think that the sperm fertilize the egg and the rest of the decisions about the embryo and the pregnancy are made by the egg, which is generally true. So the sperm, uh, we used to assume that a good looking sperm has good DNA and that's sort of not true now. So you can have deeper problems with the sperm, not necessarily mutations and chromosomal issues, but broken DNA uh, and all this stuff can happen, which can affect downstream events after fertilization, both naturally and in a dish. So this is all about 10 years old. And um, it probably the, the most studied of these issues is DNA fragmentation, which is something that changes with male age. It changes with abstinence. The older the sperm are, the more fragmented the DNA is. It changes with uh, medications and uh, recreational drugs and fevers um, and illnesses if your body's not healthy. And it, what it is is the packaging quality of the DNA in the sperm is altered by these things. And then when the sperm gets looked at by the egg, the DNA, it's kind of broken. And the egg has to say, okay, you want me to fix this before we go forward? So fertilization occurs naturally or in a dish. And then subsequent embryo development is affected and it doesn't go well. It's like a dance, right? Like a tango. If one of the two partners isn't in great shape, it, it, may, it may fall apart. So uh, that is uh, a whole body of science that's real called DNA fragmentation. And it's not obvious from a semen analysis. I can figure, figure it out from a man's history. If he's smoking a lot, doing weed or, you know, other or hot tubs or whatever, I can figure out certain medications what's going on in, in, in his age, and then we can measure it. And right now, for instance, varicocele repair will fix DNA fragmentation and antioxidant supplements can help, not as much as varicocele. And we have chips now that can sort sperm for the best sperm, uh, microfluidic chips on one is called Zymot Fertility. Um, and those can give you the best sperm in the pack. So there's ways to do it. And my belief is that, you know, we, I assume, that every infertile couple has a male factor. And I just trying to minimize it. So if she's 40 and he's 40 and his sperm counts normal, everything's normal on him. And she's okay too, unexplained 40, she's 40 and he's 40. Um, there's gonna be a male factor and it might be fragmentation even if everything else looks good and you should do whatever you can to help them. So he needs to stay healthy. He should be on an antioxidant supplement. You, need, you know, all things in moderation, um, because it is a team sport and he's half of it. And if that doesn't work, then you can use these new chips and things to sort sperm and get bet the best sperm in the pack. So there are technologies coming out that can help. At IVF, you can do pixie. So instead of having a, a person pick your sperm, you can have a, a dish do it so the sperm binds to something on the dish which is similar to the egg and then you use that sperm that sperm has demonstrated uh something it does naturally uh, and so it's probably more closer to what darwin or god would pick for your sperm and that has improved rates a little bit so but my belief is that in the extremes of age of men and, and women uh and especially both that you should do whatever you can to that guy because because age matters and you have to you have to optimize them. And so, so for women, and, they often say at age 35, they start to notice that decline. It's not a switch, but there's a decline. For men, then, if you see a man at a certain age, when are you like, even though your semen analysis is normal, we really looking at diet antioxidant. You mentioned that you work with acupuncturists in your city. 
if a guy's 25, are you as concerned versus what age do you really want? Like, cause I, I'm going to ask this again, women know 35, they need to be proactive. They need to take care of it. Men, we know from some of the great celebrities, men are having kids in their eighties. Right. Yeah. And so, um, is there a biological clock for men when it comes to, cause our goal is healthy baby, not just a baby. So where do you think men should start to really think about their age when it comes to fertility and being more proactive than just having intercourse when the timing's right? Well, I think 40 is a reasonable, so it's not, it's sort of a slow linear curve, uh, things, of, you know, after 25 men age. And so for instance, fragmentation rate will go up by about 1% per year. So a 40 year old man, so fragmentation rate of 25 year olds, 15%, a 40 year old 15 years older would be 30% and 30% would be an area where it might cause a problem. So I think that 40 is a reasonable one for that kind of thinking. It's also reasonable to start thinking about paternal age issues with offspring, um, you know, 40 to 50 range, but really start worrying about it at 60 to 65. I don't know if you saw that great paper from Mike Skinner that came out looking at sperm epigenetic profiles Remember, these aren't mutations. This is just marks on DNA that predict autism that in the in the autism genes, human sperm. That fabulous study. So uh, there will probably be a test within a couple of years, not promising, uh, that will look at sperm and figure out if there's a significant risk of that sperm in that man causing autism in a child because there is a relationship between paternal age and neural developmental or psychiatric disorders and autisms at the top of the list. So it's fascinating what's going on, but I guess my point is sperm really matter. You may not think they do, and the guy doesn't think it does, but they really matter in a lot more situations than you think. So we used to think that if IVF didn't go well with a guy, with unex a couple with unexplained infertility, everything's normal and the IVF doesn't go well, the embryos, the ICC, et cetera, and they don't get pregnant, that that was almost all female, maybe 5% male. Now we think it's maybe half male. And so if a couple goes through an IVF, she gets a good yield, they get several eggs, they're mature, really poor fertilization, they don't grow to day five, she seems healthy, he's on a couple of medications, <laughs> Um, do we just focus on the female or should we start looking at the guy? Of course you should look at the man for that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, just, not, and it's not just looking at a sperm count in an, I, in a, you know, a guy, an IVF center. It's, he needs to be examined and looked at carefully and talked to. In fact, he should have been talked to before the IVF. Right. And then um, another follow-up question just your style of practice then. So are you embracing integration in your practices in California? You're working with Chinese medicine doc. Cause I, I think that it's important for the public to hear this. You're a reproductive urologist. And so um, you send people to IVF, but also with the men you're working with um, Chinese medicine, doctors, naturopathic physicians to help with their lifestyle, acupuncture, et cetera, or is it just um, uh, Western uh, in your clinic. So, Lauren, I am a faculty member at Yosan University School of Traditional Chinese Medicine. <laughs> okay. I have a randomized trial on herbal non-opiates for pain control. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I am all about it. And, and and I'll say my you know big statement is I'm also an epigeneticist, and I'm also been doing you know, genetics research and published hundreds of papers. But I would tell you that the more we learn about the, the science of sperm and the epigenetics and genomics and proteomics and metabolomics and transcriptomics, the more I'm convinced that lifestyle matters. And therefore, the whole Eastern community is, is becoming incredibly important. I think the Eastern community can save us. Is, this is the Chinese medicine philosophy is that diet and lifestyle is the first intervention in our medicine. Yep. We do acupuncture and herbs, but it's always stated the first, that is part of the medicine. The diet and lifestyle is the medicine, and that's the first stage of, or first intervention. Um, you know, in my practice at Acubalance in Vancouver, um, when we write and we do videos, um, we talk to the female for male fertility because we know the men aren't even paying attention. Not all, but the majority of them. And the, my 
since 2000, more and more men are getting involved. But if we have a message then for the women, if you're trying to get pregnant, do you have a message for them about their guys? And um, basically, we sh should we reverse, you know, the caveman days, was it the man would club the woman and pull her by the hair? Is this what we have to do now? The woman has to club the man and pull him into the clinic? Yes, I think the woman should, the partner should look at the male and say, honey, do this for me. Because he's not going to do it for himself, especially if he's not in pain or his life's not threatened. But if his life's threatened with a club, or if if it's just love, he'll do it for love. He'll do it. Just I'll set I'll set this appointment up, and um, I want you to go to this appointment. And I, I I love it when they come alone, because they're like, my wife sent me here. <laughs> and do you know why you're here? No, I, I, my wife sent me here. You get that? That's the first question I ask. Why are you here? And I'm always, because my wife told me to be here. <laughs> so you get it. I too. love it. And so I say, okay, listen, what we'll do is I'll, I'll take care of you today. You'll only see me once. I'll get everything done. We'll do the rest by phone. And I'll give you a copy of everything we did today. So when you go home, you can put it on the kitchen table and show her the four page evaluation that you've got, because I know she's going to call, right? She's going to say, what happened? And I'll say, this is, it's all there. And uh, we'll talk later and write your questions down. And, you know, it's, it's got to be non-threatening, right? So you can't hurt the guy. So like, for instance, a prostate exam on an infertile man, unless there's a reason to do it, I have been deferring that. It's not that valuable anyway, but you know, that'll guarantee they'll never show up again. <laughs> <laughs> got to work it's, with the species. I know. And I'm chuckling because... Um, and the and the females listening to this will appreciate it, but uh, as a guy, the they have to go through so much if they do an IVF. The the injections, the procedures, the extraction of the eggs, and all the guy has to do is masturbate for the IVF process. And we're like, we don't want to get involved. So I, I still find it hard getting over my head that a guy doesn't want to change his diet or take the supplements. And um, but what the female partner has to go through. So to me, it's just so much cheaper and less invasive if the guy does his part, because I, I think the focus here is healthy baby. Right. And so even though right. the analysis is normal, you're not just saying that this will help increase your chances of getting pregnant. If the guy changes his diet, lifestyle, antioxidants, if he does this, you're also suggesting that it's going to change the epigenetics. So health blueprint of the child. Right. And the health of the guy because you've talked about male infertility is the canary in the mine you're you use this as a biomarker of the guy's health correct? right that's right okay. yeah i do i i do think though that there's a cultural issue with fertility in men it's something they never thought about and it 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 gets at their manhood and there's a lot of denial around it and that's you know that's too bad but uh, so I see it a lot with the men who have no sperm. So I have a big population of men with no sperm who want kids. And, you know, I asked them, what's the first thing that crossed your mind when you found out that there's no sperm in your semen? He said, I said, I had a biological identity crisis. Mm -hmm. You know, that kind of, it really hits them hard, like from, it knocks their knees out. And so I appreciate that because the females, when they have an unsuccessful menstrual cycle or an IVF, it, it's they say it's like getting a diagnosis for a terminal illness, and then for the man, if it's male factor, it at our cult, the culture, as you mentioned, of the man, it seems to be really uh, difficult for the guy. And I respect that. I mean, it's just the way we're built. Uh, it's the way the culture is, and you, I kind of view them as wild animals, and you have to treat them that way, and you know, not badly, but you just have to be gentle, and not and go slowly. And, you know, when their eyes glaze over, you stop talking and give them stuff to read and get them to walk the walk. That's what you want to do. You get them to walk the walk because they won't unless there's, you know, but if the woman, the partner says, do it for me, you know, if you love me, you do it for me, you know, not, maybe not that strong, but that's usually motivating. That usually gets most men going. And again, this is part of what can we do? We're having this conversation. So we're educating. We realize we're talking more to the female um, right. listening to this, um, but at least we're educating. And hopefully you'll sit down with your partner and you can watch this together. And um, you can check out, um, again, Dr. Paul Turek's clinic. Um, his blog is turekonmenshealth.com. You can check out his clinic. I know Dr. Turek does um, telehealth uh, and phone yeah, consults. Sure.
And, um, and on acubalance.ca, we have a fabulous fertility diet that you can download. It's for free. It has a book with recipes that you can download um, that's both for good for men um, and women. And we also have information on um, what men can do to optimize their fertility. And so um, I want to thank you again for taking the time and sharing what uh, the sharing the research and sharing your approach to integration to help increase pregnancy rates for couples. Um, the health blueprint of the baby, and then obviously the health of the mom and dad to be all very important. Very Absolutely, important. Lauren. Thank you.